you know what the next crisis would look like. I could probably it might be a little bit helpful in stopping, but there will be other crises. There is no way of knowing when you're in a situation like we were in in the fall of 2008 or 9 when or precisely how it will end. You know the United States will come back. The, the, the factories don't disappear, the farmland doesn't disappear, the skills of the people don't disappear. But you had a system which was going to put them all in an idle position or could do it. And there's no way of knowing how far it was going to go. What's left from the crisis is pretty much of memories. I mean, the tracks are still there, the train's still there, but we had a big interruption in 2008 or 2009. And now the train has been running pretty darn well. and. Uh, We've shown that uh, America can't be stopped. Hello and welcome February 2021. We made it. This is Vanessa Growlish, and today I want to talk about the 2008 crisis. What happened, how the United States reacted, what regulations um, happened, and I also want to tell you my own story of what happened in 2008 because this is important to understand history so it doesn't repeat again. I just posted um, the video of Warren Buffett basically explaining that when 2008, um, when, when this crisis happened and then he's talking about here in 2018, and obviously this is before COVID, but he discusses, uh, and he obviously this man is a capitalist, and he says the message of the whole video is, yes, we were on a train and then we got derailed, but the United States is a country that has the resources, has the land, and we can keep, we, we can do it, we can keep moving, right? However, what is the difference between 2008 and what is the difference between the crisis that we're uh, facing right now, which they're a little bit different. So let's talk about 2008 and I'm just going to tell you first my story and then we're going to go, we're going to discuss what is subprime mortgage. We're going to talk about conventional mortgage. I'm going to talk about the dot frank regulations. I'm going to explain to you who are these two people who made this regulation and why they were needed regulations. And then let's talk about what could happen with um, all these regulations. And yes, we're going to talk again about Mr. Robert Schiller. This is a Nobel Prize economist. He talks about irrational exuberance. And I have been reading this book and I want to discuss the things that I'm reading about this book because he talks about the housing bubble and everything, every bubble that, uh, you know, investors always think. Because let's remember, everything on investment is driven by emotions, right? How we feel the market is going to go up. If you feel the market is going to go up, then, you know, you have like a bull market because you go like the bull, ooh, prices are going to go up. But if you have a bearish market, which is like a bear, you would want this, you know, stock price to go down. And that's basically what the short sellers want, right? So when you hear someone like uh, Mr. Buffett, you can see that this guy always believes that the price are going to go up. Not always, but he's a very positive investor, you know, based on the interview that we just saw. So let's go ahead and talk about 2008. So I'm going to tell you my first experience. At that time, I think I was between 27 and 28 when this, is, when this was happening. And I just, uh, you know, started in a Haymath group, but at the same time I had like, you know, two jobs. I was a server, a bartender. At the same time, I had an office job because I wanted to do my own business. And of course, 2008 comes and the surprise mortgages are alive. They start coming up. What is a surprise mortgage? So let's start from there. So you're going to have two types of mortgages. You're going to have the conventional and you're going to have the subprime. When you have a subprime mortgage, it's basically when you don't have that really good credit and, you know, banks really ugh, think that you're very risky. And let's go over this chart really quick over the difference between the subprime mortgage against the conventional. So let's say, um, let me just show you here on the screen. So a prime mortgage, for example, is also known as conventional loan. And this is available for B plus to A borrowers. What does that mean? Well, these people usually have a good credit score. They have a job. They can show in the last two years that, you know, the tax records, they have been stable, to put it like that. So they're going to be able to get a lower interest rate. And uh, most likely, you know, they're going to be able to 
support the mortgage assuming that all the conditions where they were qualified continue. What about subprime? Well, subprime is what they call for the VC borrowers. What does that mean? Well, these are borrowers that are not so qualified and they usually have low income, they have an insecure job, they have history of defaulting, they have bad credit ratings. And usually when they, you know, when in 2008, when they will get a house, the house price or their mortgage was way much higher than what they really could, you know, what they could afford. So I'm gonna give you an example. So I was working at an office part-time and I remember the secretary, at that time I was like working like, you know, um, as a part-time bookkeeper and the secretary, she had four kids. She was 26 at that time, yes. And I remember she lived in Homestead at the time and I remember um, her buying a house and I remember asking her because obviously, you know, she has a big family. And I was like, oh, so how much, you know, did you pay for your house? Regular question, 2008. And then she's like, well, the house costs almost $400,000, but our mortgage payment is literally $800. And I was thinking, what? How did you get a, almost a half a million dollar house with such a low mortgage payment? So then she said, no, listen, if you call this guy, he can qualify you. Don't worry about it. This is exactly how 2008 was. Don't worry about it. They don't check your job history. They don't check your credit. Literally, all what you have to do is breathe. Remember, this is before regulations and before the Frank Doll, um, you know, which we're going to talk about it. Before any regulations, uh, you know, this is before, to, before the market crash. You will literally will just call a loan officer. And I'm going to tell you, it was so hard to get a hold of any loan officer at the time because they were all making so much money. They didn't even care of picking up the phone because there were people calling and calling. So then what happened? You call this guy. At this time, I wasn't a loan originator, so I really didn't understand, you know. I mean, I had a little bit of knowledge of math, and that, that's what a little bit scared me, how this guy talked to me. Because this guy was literally 22 years old. In order to be a loan originator in Florida, you require a high school diploma and just basically, you know, to get your license and all this. So this 22-year-old guy, he's just, you know, I was over the phone and I said, listen, I would like to see, you know, how much I can afford, if I have this income, blah, 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 blah. I was very straight with him. And I just remember telling him, don't worry about it. We'll give you a subprime mortgage. And I said, what's that? He says, look, basically, the interest rates are so low right now that all what you have to do is fill out the documentation. And then from there, you're going to see that your interest payments are going to be so low because all what you're paying right now is interest. And then later on, then you're going to get your regular fixed payments. So these were very, very common. You will have like a low interest rate for three years, which is called an adjustable interest rate. And then the rate will adjust after three years you can guess what happened. People like me, people like everyone were like, oh, okay, perfect. Let me, you know, take a look of, of what's available. Then what happens? You will go get the realtor. You have your pre-qualification letter, which think about this. It was just so easy to get a loan that the realtors, everyone was making money back and forward. And whoever says that they were not part of this problem, you're a liar because yes, everyone was part of the problem, but no one wanted to stop. And when you watch the whole interview with uh, Mr. Buffett, the one that I'm putting here, you're going to see that everyone was playing the game. He called it like a Cinderella ballroom. And no one wanted to leave the party. <laughs> everyone knew it was going to stop or whatever. So then what happens? Everyone started getting these loans. And then obviously, let's put again the example of this person that I was working with. You start paying 800, 800, and then, you know, you think, but oh, wait, why not get two houses or maybe three? And that's what started to happen. You will get a house, rent it, and then another house and rent it. And then basically the whole thing, it was just, if you were able to breathe, you were able to get two or three houses. At this time, this is the millennium. Uh, boom and you know Facebook this whole thing is coming up so of course everyone that was a millennial like I remember if you were 30 you had to have a good car and you have to have like you know your condo because everyone else was doing it it was just awful then what happens so when does this crisis happen because 
these uh, subprime mortgages were so risky, the payment starts going up and then people, like the secretary that I explained to you, they go from $800 payment and then, you know, when the interest rate is, it starts to be adjustable because, you know, the risks start going up. So interest start going up because it's risk and reward relationship. The rates go so high that now what happens? Boom, you have the problem that you cannot afford it. And that's when the foreclosures started happening. At that time, I remember people will go foreclosure and they will just literally rent the houses until the guy will come literally to like knock the house and be like, you can't be here anymore. So people were kind of like desperate of what, of what was happening because everyone went from think that they, they had all this illusion, this unicorn that, oh, I have three properties. But you didn't because remember, when you borrow money from the bank, that's not an asset if you cannot pay it back. That's actually a liability if you're not able to pay it back. So subprime mortgages, that's basically what happened in 2008, with the difference that in 2020, the virus is not, uh, it's, it's, it's a different force, to put it like this, that basically changed the market and, and changed the economy. Because in 2008, even though things were bad, the structure was still there. When I mean the structure is that, you know, you didn't have lockdowns, you, don't, you didn't have restrictions. So 2020, it's a little bit different now because yes, we do have the resources, but now if you have a restaurant and before you needed, you know, let's say like your, your break even point to put it away and the break even point, what it is, is like, um, it's basically like how many sales do I need to do a day to be able to, you know, break even or basically after you break even, you make a profit. We'll do a video about that in another section. But what's happening now? Well, what's happening now is that it's not about subprime mortgages anymore because then in 2008, when all this disaster happens, then President Obama, he says, okay, we need regulations. And this is how the Dodd-Frank Wall Street Reform and Consumer Protection Act comes into life. Uh, now let's talk about it. Um, basically the Dodd-Frank it's so important and anytime you get a mortgage or anytime you 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 feel like someone is not being <laughs> completely ethical to you in the real estate market on the housing market take a look at the dot frank why because the dot frank was basically and i'm going to just go ahead and read it um this is the law overhaul financial regulation in the aftermath of the great recession and it made changes affecting all federal financial regulatory agencies and almost every part of the nation's financial service industry. Now think about this, uh, the, it's called uh, the Dodd-Frank, and let me just tell you the names of the two, um, let me see, this right here, give me one second, uh, here it is. Okay, so why do we call it the Dodd-Frank? Because it was Senator Christopher J. Dodd, that comes the Dodd, and Representative Barney Frank, um, and basically it's almost 2,300 pages that needs to be implemented over a period of several years. I'm posting all of these links so then you can read about it. And then the question is, um, what, what can happen with, uh, you know, this GameStop thing happen? So now the stock market, the hedge fund people are like, you know, shaking. Consumers at the same time are thinking, okay, What's going on? And think about this. When, when 2008 happened, 28 year old like me was just in the going. Just like now, I have people that I, you know, that I hear that are in their 20s, 25, and they're thinking about Bitcoin and thinking about all this investment. So, all what I want to reintegrate with this um, little um, video is that. Try to read as much as you can about the different crises that have happened before because it's just a pattern. This, you know, again, math, right? Everything that goes up, goes down, up and down, and so on. I want to go ahead and just, you know, tell you a little bit about chapter one. Now, uh, Irrational Exuberance, this is the book that I've been talking about. Uh, it starts with Alan Greenspan, and Alan Greenspan, he was the chair of the Federal Reserve Board for many years, and he one day just, you know, he was, when he was talking, he says, 
Well, um, he used the term irrational exuberance, and this is how Professor, um, I'm going to say Dr. Schiller, um, describes it. Now, let me just go ahead and do his description. So this is how he describes it. Irrational exuberance is the psychological basis of a speculative, a speculative, uh, speculative bubble. I define a speculatively, I cannot say a speculative bubble, as a situation in which news of price increases, sports investors enthusiasts, enthusiasts, I cannot read today, which is spread by psychological contagion from person to person. Exactly what's happening with Bitcoin, exactly, it's all about you hear someone else and be like, hey, don't, did you see how Bitcoin is going up? And then you're like, oh my God, I can't know myself. And you start and you start. And basically, that's how he talks about irrational exuberance because it's just basically all a speculation, all, all psychological. So we are all part of this problem. Can we stop this problem? No, we're humans. This is what we, you know, we've been doing for years, centuries. Um, I want to make a video about the history of the first time they were doing short selling, which I saw uh, um, um, in a video on NPR, so I want to share it. But all what I want to, you know, talk today was how 2008 basically was, at least, you know, on my eyes, because I was here in the United States and we survived. We survived. Eventually, any investor that didn't do well was able to recuperate. I cannot tell you how many people in their 30s at that time, like, you know, contemporary to me, when you ask them, they're like, oh, you know, bankruptcy. Oh, yeah, <laughs> we went bankrupt because blah, 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 blah. And this is not something that you ever want to go through, bankruptcy or, you know, having a back pain or anything like that. But at the same time, it, it teaches you that the system is not a party. So if you're able to, if you want to cross the ocean, right, you need to make sure that you know how to fix the boat. You need to make sure that you know how to sail. So, you know, the more information, the better. So I'm going to be reading more of this book and sharing more of, um, you know, whatever I'm learning. Thank you so much. This is Vanessa Graulich, and I hope you have a great day.